did they show up? <laughs> There's a snowstorm, so some people had trouble getting here. Who had trouble getting here because of the snowstorm? I know you did. Went from 80 degrees to 17 degrees. And, and six inches of snow. Wow. And I know our apple stand. Where's our apple stand? Where are they? Oh, there you go. You had a little trouble with the delay, got in late last night. So thank you for everybody coming here for part of this movement. And that's what it is. It's a movement. And uh, anything you want to say? No, thank you very much, everybody, for coming. We're super excited for this weekend. Awesome. Okay. Okay. So. Bye. All right. Before I get started, I just want to call one person. Uh, Taylor Whitmire, stand up. Taylor Whitmire, stand up. Taylor just, um, you know, I'm not a runner. If somebody has to do a 5K, I go, I can drive it. <laughs> and then they say a 10K, I'm like, are you crazy? And then somebody can do a marathon, I go, are you really crazy? But Taylor just finished the Tahoe 200. Woo! A 200 mile foot race took me 96 hours. Dude, it's a plane. <laughs> well done, let's give a round of applause. So what we're going to do, and that was awesome for me, by the way, thank you, Ethan. What we're going to try to do here this weekend is we're going to try to help solve a problem. You guys want to do that? Yeah. Okay. Right. So when you have a problem and you have to solve it, the first thing you have to do is do it pretty fast. Not as fast as right now. I upset when I saw him. Pretty close. What you got to do is you got to do what first? You got to confront the problem. You got to look at it. Most people take their problems and they go, you know, I just don't want to look at that. And they put it in their back pocket. So they had to pick the gnarliest person to come up and pull that problem out of your pocket and get you to look at it and put it right in front of your face. That's my job. Hey, Karen. Well, so we're going to have to look at this. We're going to have to look at the current state of healthcare in the U.S. That's going to be first. Then we've got to look at, well, if you don't like that, we can't just really about it, we've got to come up with a solution. So we're going to talk about that. And then throughout the weekend, you know, how many were at the convention in Orlando? Okay, wow, awesome. So here's what Grant Carlin said. Best product doesn't win, best known always wins every time. So if we got a great product and we don't get it known, shame on us. So you're going to learn from some top experts on how to brand yourself and how to market yourself this weekend. We have some awesome people showing you ways to do that. But we're going to have to walk through a little bit of fire because our opponent is not an easy opponent. The pharmaceutical industry has a lot of K and they got a lot of power. So we're going to have to be strong. So you're going to hear some speakers this weekend and today tell you how to be strong and how to push through to actually get to your goal. You know the difference between a dream and a goal, right? A goal is a dream with a deadline. So we're going to try to show you how we're going to solve the problem of healthcare in the United States in the next five years. Woo, woo, woo. That's our deadline. Okay? So it's not a dream anymore. It's a goal. And then what we're going to do is show you a way that AMI has evolved to actually help carry you through this minefield. That's pretty exciting. Isn't it? Yeah. So this weekend is going to be all about confronting the problem, looking at what can be done. Going over the model that can fix the problem, and then how do we get there? Guess what? It is your duty, if you're part of this team, it is your duty, if you're part of this team, to be successful in your field. Because that's the only way we're going to change. And we're going to show you that this week. Sound good? Yeah. All right. Should we get started? Yes. Here we go. So i got to tell you, I've spent the last two and a half decades, Holly and I, working in an integrated setting. And when I first did it, I was very afraid to work with medical doctors and work with nurse practitioners and PAs. It was a little bit, you know, daunting. I was like, oh, are they going to hate me? Am I going to hate them? Are we going to fight? What's going to happen? And I got to tell you, for two and a half decades, I cannot imagine practicing without a medical practitioner doing it. Because the patients get a better outcome. I've learned that 80% of chiropractors, just like 80% of medical doctors, and probably 90% of extenders, NPs, and PAs 
just like a 90% physical therapist, got into healthcare with the original proposition, I want to help people. You understand that? So what we do is we align with those 80 percenters. And we realize that if we get together, we can overcome the obstacles of healthcare. Sound good? Yes, sir. All right. So how many of you agree that healthcare is broken in this country? Our health system is broken in this country. Well, I was talking to Dave Marsh yesterday, I love him, and he said, it's not broken. It's doing exactly what it was designed to do. Look at that. And it was designed to sell drugs. It was designed to manage illness. And we can't just abandon that, because if we do, people are going to die today and tomorrow. So we do have to manage illness. But the system isn't all strapped up with you. And the way you figure that out is you look at the statistics, the outcomes of that system. You guys ready? Okay. So, Jamie, that's the one I'm looking at. Okay. How many of you got my book? Okay, now how many of you read it? Two hands. Oh, actually, you read it. What do you think? Yeah, great. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to review a little bit of stats from this book. We did a lot of research. I had stats in my head from being on the radio for four years and doing lectures all over the country, and when, I, when we started researching this book, the stats were worse than I thought they were. They got worse. So we're going to look at these stats. So the United States groups, oh, this is next one. This is next one. I got two monitors here, the next slide and this slide. So, so the United States, here's what happened in the last 10 years. The percentage of the world's population, the United States was 4.6% of the world's population, it is now 4.2% of the world's population. So either we got smaller or everybody else got bigger, probably a little bit of both. But that 4.2% of population outspends the rest of the world combined on healthcare every year. Did you know that? And in the past 10 years, the price tag for healthcare in the United States, you know, we, we brought up the Affordable Care Act to lower healthcare costs about 10 years ago. So we went from 2.4 trillion to 3.3 trillion dollars in 10 years. This is what that number looks like. I put this up here because most people go, yeah, trillion, billion, billion, it's all the same, right? Zillion. That's 3.3 trillion dollars. That's a lot of zero. So our healthcare costs have gone up in the last 10 years. But you go, well, I don't feel it. Somebody had, but well, where's the money going? That's the problem. So let's take a look at that. This is what it costs per month, per day, per hour, per minute, and per second in the United States for our health care. Just so you know, most of the world spends less than 10% of their gross national product on health care. And the highest not in the U.S. is 11.8%. The United States is at 17% of the GMP goes to health care. The Center for Disease Control has some stats on this. So they, we also have the uh, Organization of Economic Cooperative Development from the United Nations, and they have some statistics. They say of the top 35 countries they rank, the United States comes in 29th place for infant mortality. That is, how well does a baby survive the first year of life? That's not too good, is it? Considering we spend more than the entire rest of the world combined, we come in 29th out of 35. That's pretty scary. The United States ranks 26th of the top 35 countries in life expectancy. For the last three years in a row, for the first time since World War I, life expectancy in the United States went down. Now, the reason it went down during World War I is number one, we are having the Great War, the War of All Wars. And there was a pandemic, uh, I forget what the flu was, but there was a, basically um, a pandemic disease throughout the whole world. And millions of people died from it. And we had the worst life expectancy since then, right now, three years in a row. That's pretty scary. The CDC says the United States, when compared to, I think it's 195 countries, comes in 64th place in life expectancy. 64th place. 
when the uh, Organization of Economic and Profitable Development ranked the top 25, they ranked them from 1970 until 2014. And here's the graph. So the graph up the vertical is like expectancy. The graph along the bottom <coughs> me, is cost per citizen for healthcare. And you see that line across the bottom that's been in the last place and getting worse and worse and worse for the last 30 years? Who is that? The United States. That's pretty bad. That was 2014. And what you see is life expectancy is still going up. But since then, that arrow has gone down. We are not doing very well in our statistics in looking at health care at all. And it costs Americans a lot of money. And, and what we did was we tried to pass a bill to make it more affordable for people to get health care. And the stats for that are not so good either. Two-thirds of personal bankruptcies in the United States are for unpaid medical bills. And 72% of those people have insurance. These are, I mean, like, we, we have, look, just imagine we're all race car drivers. And everybody in this room has their own car. And my car costs more than all your cars put together. And every time we race, I come in the last place. What would you tell me to do? Hang it up. Well, that's where we're at in healthcare. We have the most expensive healthcare on the planet, not even close second, and we are ranking the statistics like this. This is pathetic. Here's what I'm doing right now. Doesn't feel good, does it? Because we're all part of it. We're all in healthcare. We are part of those results. And I'm not going to blame any of you, I'm going to blame myself. I am part of those results. Look at this. I am part of that guy. <laughs> I'm part of those results. If I don't take acceptance for that, I see a really tall guy back there. I can't see much, just you know, the lights are not, but that has to be Dan Beeson. Dan, good morning. Morning. Sit. Sit. Yeah, how's your stay seated? I won't make him stand up. He's a tall guy. All right. So this is really bad. 54, 54 percent of medical physicians, according to the University of California Riverside School of Medicine, feel burned out and are contemplating quitting. 54 percent. Why? Because 80 percent of them got into it to help people, and these are the results. You know, when I graduated school in 1991 as a chiropractor, there was about almost 700,000 medical doctors, and now there's about 544,000. That's a pretty big decline. Nurse practitioners were almost non existent, the were almost non existent, and now there are three nurse practitioners for every chiropractor in the United States. Because somebody's got to fill the bill, somebody's got to take over the torch. That's why a lot of the states over the last 30 years have a lot of chiropractors that own medical clinics because there's not enough medical doctors. To do it. My daughter graduated school, I have four daughters, number three graduated high school last year, and she was applying to different schools. And every school she applied to that was a med had a medical school said to her, Well, you know, you're not going to be great if you want to be a medical doctor. If you sign an agreement to be a family practitioner, the government will pay for your tuition. I was like, Come again? Oh, yeah, there's a shortage of medical doctors. And the government pays a commission if you become a primary or a family practitioner in internal medicine talk. She goes, I don't want to do that. And they go, that's the rest One of the most noble professions in our culture. And it's the window. Why? Because of this mess. This mess somehow, you know, a lot of good intentioned people, but we got into a mess that pushes and pushes and pushes. Let me show you some, some of the results of those pushes. The United States consumes 80 to 90 percent of the world's opioids. We're going to hear from the surrogate this afternoon, the White House Committee of Opioids, and he's going to show you one. And some of you have heard him speak before. He's going to talk about how dumb these stats are, so he's going to make mine look really puny. But then he's going to show you what he's been doing to actually change these. That's going to be pretty exciting. But the United States has the highest drug overdose rate in the world. 
by his death from overdose as well. 80% of heroin addicts got their start with an opioid prescription. 80% of heroin addicts got their start with an opioid prescription. What's the leading opioid prescription? What's the diagnosis for that? Back pain. That's our competition. Uh, the opioids are the leading cause of death of Americans under the age of 50. 70,000 Americans a year die from opioids. 70,000. In 10 years of Vietnam, we lost 55,000 soldiers, and they were being shot at. And we lose 70,000 a year in this country from something that we could prevent. This is really, really clean. A whole room's like it. <laughs> so I better do something to wake you guys up. Who made pain the fifth vital sign? When pain was made the fifth vital sign, this whole concept of opioids just took off. John, has this been changed yet? I know we're talking about it, but it, it's made headway, but there's some head strong docs that still. Exist. But you were telling me yesterday that the hospitals were all put on a bonus system if they had the smiling face and the frowning face and one to ten for pain. If a hospital did that, they got extra money from the government. Wouldn't you like to have the government say, and if you go to a chiropractor, wouldn't you do a rebate on your taxes? Wouldn't that be nice? If you go to a physical therapist, we're going to give you a discount on what you owe the government. That's what they did for opioids. For opioids. Horrible. The study that was done by the Joint Commission, here's what they concluded when they said this should be happening, you should have to make it about pain, the fifth part of time. It was based on the current wisdom of the time, which was around the year 2000, 2001, and they said opioid addiction is a rare occurrence. And yet, we find out that 33% of people who take opioids for three days are fully addicted. Am I right? It's, it's, uh, 30 days is 33%. 30 days? Yeah. If you take it for three days, even one day, there's an 8% chance. 8% chance if you get it's take it like one day? Year, three three days, days, we still take it. But that's a rare occurrence. How does this all happen? We're actually part of this because we're in healthcare. We have to stand up and fight. Yeah, my opinion. I think I got this wrong, but the scribe was not told that it has to be limited to five days or is it ten days? Uh, eight to twelve, and they're trying to get it to five. They're trying to get it to five. Right now, they're limited to twelve days because the vast mass of or a large amount of people are getting it in three. There's no logic in it. There's no logic in it. Let me show you this. This is. The drug, the, the drug death rate of the United States compared to other countries. See if I can do my That's the U.S. That's the rest of the world. This is just done in like the last, mostly in the last 10 years, although it's been building for 20. This is horrible stats. So when I wrote this book, Grant Cardone talked to me and said, dude, you're crazy if you release this book. You're going to follow you home running off the road. That's what he said. And that was a real concern. And I thought, what am I going to do? Am I going to be a sheep and sit in the background or am I going to take that chance? And I actually haven't talked to Colleen about this because I can be scared. So we decided to do it. And you know what? God was watching that for us because right after I released my book, another report came out and they're going to run these guys off the road before mine. Here's the report. <laughs> the report was by Gary Null and these other MDs and PhDs. And what they did was they called the report Death by Medicine. And they released these statistics. They took all the different statistics of atrocity or people dying in hospitals and they said it's really hard to put this again because they're all kept separated. Just like all the healthcare professionals are kept separated. You know what it's called? That's called mitochondria. Get the medical doctors fighting with the chiropractors. Get the physical therapists fighting with the chiropractors. Get the medical doctors looking down on the osteopaths and the nurse practitioners and the PAs. And get everybody pissed off each other and get the chiropractors to fight themselves. <laughs> and you won't have to worry about any opposition. So these guys said the same thing is true of these stats. So they compiled the study. And this just came out. Dave Marks got me this. Do you want to know? Let's <laughs> Adverse reaction to prescription drugs in the United States 2.2 million people a year. This is only on hospital. 
Number of unnecessary contrived antibiotics in the hospital in the United States per year, 20 million unnecessary antibiotic prescriptions. Unnecessary medical surgical procedures, 7.5 million. Unnecessary hospitalizations in the United States a year, 8.9 million. And then here's the answer already. Total number of deaths caused by conventional medicine in the United States, 800,000 to a million. And this is in hospital only which now officially, according to these guys, and this is a published study, medical care in a hospital is the number one cause of death. Well, took the heat off me. I'm not trying to do the rear view mirror. But what are we going to do about this? We're in this. We're part of this. Oh, no, we're part of this. Oh, no, I'm sure, Mom, fair. We're all part of this. We're part of healthcare. If we sit back and do nothing, it's like when the Nazis were coming for the, for the Jews, well, we're all Catholic. And then they came for the Protestants, we're all Catholic. Then they came for the Catholics. Are we going to do the same thing? Or are we going to stand up and do something about it? Come and do something about it. Yeah. Yeah. So apparently, you guys have come to do something about it. Which, you, you just hook the red belt, everything's going to be different tomorrow, and it'll never be the same. Okay, I, mean, I was going to take a slide out from this, okay. Who's watching out for us? Who's the watchdog watching out for us? Who's, who sets the standard for healthcare? Who owns the building codes? The American Medical Association. And when I first started working with medical doctors, I thought they were all pretty in And in 1998, my three medical doctors came to me and said, we're going on the strike. Like, well, what did I do? Oh, no, not us. The whole county of medical doctors is going on the strike. You ever hear that? Medical doctors going on the strike. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. What are you going on the strike for? And they said, well, this year, when we joined the Chester County Medical Association, which we all want to belong to, they're going to enroll us for free in the end of the night. And I went, are you guys all in the end of the night? They went, no, no, that's your company. That's the first time I heard about it. So, all right, in 2008, when President Obama announced the Affordable Care Act, he said the AMA is behind him, less than 8% of physicians were members of the AMA. And if you read Kevin Campbell's study, a medical doctor who just put this out, basically he said, now, right now, the AMA is claiming 12% membership. But he said, they're making less money off of dues than they did in 2008. So he looked into it and found out they're getting free membership to students and retired doctors. And he said, that's kind of like a frat house saying, we'll give free membership to all the freshmen as the membership takes the same group that you start on campus. That's what they're doing. So, they also own the building codes. They also own the insurance companies. Who gets paid what? Their primary income source is from the American Pharmaceutical Advertising Council. So the American Pharmaceutical Advertising Council controls the standard of care and who gets paid what in this country. Does that explain some of the statutes you look at? Yes. So this is the more disturbing step in the seventy change and seventy this. And when I first read it, I thought that can't be true. Cyber censorship. Google has gone all out with big pharma to push drugs and disease while simultaneously blocking access to life-saving health information. That was published in the medical news. Oh, there's some alternative. Get you like some of it. Right? They're actively altering search engine results. So for example, if you type in organic, it automatically auto-completes search engine. Seven of the first ten choices that pop up are negative and include organic is not better, organic is a sham, organic is a myth, organic is not really organic, organic is bad for the environment, organic is fake. Don't believe me, I did it, that's the way it came up. They did the same thing for supplements. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Just think about it, I'm going, crap, why don't I think about it? The pen is mightier than the sword, so we take all over all the media publications, but where's everybody getting the news now? The internet, and all you gotta do is go to Google. Ugh. I should have thought of that. They're pretty sharp, but that's what they're doing. That's what they're doing. They're mind controlling you. They're trying to cut off access to all the information. So who's going to say? All of you. And we're going to teach you this weekend how to do that. 
Okay? We're going to teach you this weekend how to do that. How to market. Best product does win. Best stone always wins. So let's make it best product and best stone. Yeah. 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 That is the only way we're going to change it. You know when I first had this concept? When I injured my neck in 1986, and I decided to become a chiropractor, and I started realizing, well, what, what's, why is chiropractic like, you know, why do people have like a little stigma on chiropractic? I will tell you why people have a stigma on chiropractic. Because the AMA doesn't want people to walk. So what they said was, their first plan was, medical doctor, if you are a chiropractor, if you go to a chiropractor, we're going to all charges in front of the board. That's true. It took the chiropractors to sue the AMA, and it took from 1990 or 72 to 1987 to win the Wilk case. I don't care about the Wilk case. Where it looked, just the Wilk chiropractor had a class after suit against the AMA. It took all those years for the chiropractors to win. And the federal judge, Susan Gessner, said, yeah, man, you are guilty, 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 and you must let the practitioners work together. So plan B was, chiropractic's not safe. I graduated in 1991, and the month I graduated, covered Time Magazine, chiropractic linked to strokes. How many of you saw that study? It still pops up every once in a while. I'm like, oh, this is not good for my career. <laughs> So then I went to study and I started doing some crunching of numbers and I figured out that yeah, chiropractic is linked to strokes. Pretty much like Earth is linked to exploding from some asteroid hitting it, possibly. In fact, when you heard the study, it said, of course, getting your hair cut has a higher risk of stroke. <laughs> and working on your sink underneath the plumber has a higher chance of having a stroke than a chiropractor does. And what happened was, chiropractors actually handled that pretty well. We came up, we got people to endorse us, people from the American uh, Art Association saying, chiropractic is way safer than taking an aspirin. How do I know that? My mother almost bled to death this year taking aspirin because she thought it was good for her heart. She's 90 years old, almost bled to death, ended up in the hospital. She couldn't come out and visit us in Oregon from taking aspirin while the woman didn't do it. Mom, that's a drug. Right? So chiropractors stood up and said, we are not dangerous. So that one went by the wayside too. But which one stuck? What's the way to keep people from coming into you? Chiropractors over-recommend care. They rip you off. If you're treated at your pain is gone, they're ripping you off. And people are, I'm not. I'm not. Except when they ask people, you go to a chiropractor, that's the number one reason why they don't go. And 90% of people say they don't go. Because they want me to sign up for what? But another study done in California about eight years ago on a lot of people said, under what condition would you go to a chiropractor? And the answer was, if it was medically supervised. Shazam! Light bulb. I could not do this job without that people working with me because I cannot get the results I get without them. It's not like, oh, this is a convenient thing and make us look better. Uh-huh, this is a better outcome for the patient. And that's rule number one. Rule number one is no matter what we do, if we're going to tackle this problem, we have to make the outcome better for the patient. And we can't do it with just our practice. We can improve it for sure. It's the missing ingredient, but we can't do it without it. Number two, we better do it compliantly because we got this big bad monster who controls the media trying to put us under. They're going to try to knock you off your block. So you better do everything right. It's got to be compliant. That's rule number two. And then rule number three, it's got to be profitable. And I'm going to explain to you tomorrow afternoon in detail why and how we're going to do this. It's your duty to be profitable. You can't change. Look, you want to change health care? You can probably do it without money if you're Mother Teresa. <laughs> you can probably do it without money if you were Gandhi. But I don't see too many Mother Teresa and Gandhi in this room. Having money isn't a necessity, but on the guy's habit list, it's right next to oxygen. <laughs> and with money, it makes it easier. That was also the first. <laughs> but with money, you can solve a lot of problems. 
Is that keeping your eyes open? That's what we're doing. So we gotta get strong. It's our duty to succeed if we're gonna change this mess that we all agree exists. Because insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Time for a change. You're gonna run into resistance. But we gotta do something about this. So the number one we gotta do is change our viewpoint. And that's why I created this thing. And I don't even know how long ago I created this, but I've been teaching this to thousands and thousands of people. I'll bet you everybody in this room or all of us everybody in this room has seen it. How many people have not seen this? Two people. Okay, next one. No. I'm gonna do it again. Because we need to know this, right? One of the things we have out is the way we look at disease. If we were to chart a disease and plot the disease, there's the day that the disease starts, and this is the day the disease ends. What happens on that day? Let's change that. Yes, who said that? Who said that? Stand up. Dennis, Dennis Buckley, former president of California. I, I can see Dennis in this light, so he must be an angel. <laughs> Say it again, Dennis. Get better. They get better. We gotta start saying that. On this day, you get better. I've said this to about 20 or 30,000 people, and I think three people. Dennis is now number four. But he's never speaking for But I love him anyway. Three, four people said you get better. Everybody else said you die. What well, happens when they say, oh, you die? Let's change that viewpoint. Let's get it better. You guys with me? Yeah. Okay. So when you get the disease, you know the day you get it? What do you got to experience? You know you got a problem. A symptom. So does that symptom occur in the first half or the second half of most diseases? Second half. So if you look at the top, well, the old top was death. Heart disease is down number two. 700,000 Americans die from heart disease every year. You guys know this answer, so you shout it out. 50% of those people have the same first symptom. What is it? Yeah. Death. 50% of the second leading cause of death in the United States has their first symptom as they're hitting the floor for the last time. What's the second, or I'm sorry, now the third leading cause of death in the United States? Cancer. cancer. Raise your hand if you personally knew somebody that had cancer in your life. Raise them up. Okay, so you're all qualified. Can you have tumors and not have a symptom? For how long? Years. So why are we using symptoms as a barometer? It's like they show up so late, that's where we're going to treat the disease. This is why we have the most expensive, least effective health care on the planet, because that's our window of treatment. And what do we do? We give them drugs and they don't feel it. We give them drugs and say, oh, your cholesterol is better. And the person goes, huh, what? I forgot, who are you? Because we just demyelinated your brain and taken that drug for years. That study has been trying to emerge for the last four years. I first heard about that 20 years ago. That cholesterol medication demyelinates your brain. And I went on Google, and they, they all studied how good cholesterol medication is, except for two at the bottom, reference the shoddy studies that were released in 2016 and 2018 about how cholesterol really has no effect on your body. And people who don't take cholesterol medication live longer than people who do. That's true. We got to change our viewpoint. We got to start saying disease is the body functioning normally. I mean, I'm sorry, the absence of disease is the body functioning normally. Just think about it. Who thought of that word? What does that word mean? A lack of ease. Your body's not working right. It's not pain. It's a lack of ease. In fact, if you're not telling your patients when you start to do regenerative medicine with them that they might experience some symptoms, I told my meniscus running an airport in July. Those of you who were at the Masters saw me have to sit down on the stool for two days because I couldn't stand up. So I got my knee injected about six weeks ago. In the first two weeks, it sucked. I was like, holy oh, crap. But now, I ran up and down those stairs out there yesterday. I'm like, I'm going to do that again. And I ran up and down. I could up for the conscious day. I mean, it's just fine. But the first two weeks hurt. We weren't trying to handle the symptom. We were trying to fix the problem. That's what we gotta do. We gotta shift to that viewpoint. Everything has to do with has to improve function. Not symptoms. Symptoms will go away when function is normal. Agree? Yep. Yep. And they'll stay away. If you're in the business of selling bullets to kill symptoms, you don't like that theory. Just you want to sell bullets. We're in the business of getting people well. So how do you get people well? You get people well by addressing the causes of health. 
And I dare anybody to tell me of another cause. You got mental causes, physical causes, and chemical causes. Mental stress causes a chemical reaction in your body and a physical reaction in your body. Physical stress does the same. Chemical stress does the same. So it's a triangle because you have to address all three of these. But if you address just one, the other two get better. If you address the physical, you're going to improve the nervous system. But you really want to be affected, doc? Excuse me, doctor. Address the physical and the chemical. How can you address the chemical? With drugs or with nutrition? Nutrition, right? You know, if somebody needs a drug, they should do a blood test to see if you're deficient first. And if you're deficient, just supplemental with drugs. But if you actually want to get well, you test to see if you're deficient with nutrients. And if you're deficient, you should be taking those nutrients. Because now you're balancing two angles or two corners of the triangle. That's how you get somebody well. This is how you change up here. You know why we <laughs> You're freaking me out up here, man. You know why we don't balance that triangle? Because there's no money in it for the big industries. There is money in it for the practitioners. But they don't want the practitioners to get the money, they want the industry to get the money. We have to make it so that we can show people that balancing that triangle will get them involved. You think people would want that? I'm a marketer. When we hired survey companies to go in the city, if you ever open a clinic in a state you've never lived in, how do you know the vibe of that city? How do you know the market to that city? You got to do studies. So we would ask questions. We would go in and we'd say, you think healthcare is good? We always get no. Why do you think it's not good? Too many drugs. And a lot of times they blame the doctors where someone goes to the pharmaceutical industry. I don't blame the doctors. The doctors are put into a standard of care that promotes writing drugs. But the problem is, when we say to these people, so you don't believe in pharmaceutical drugs, so what do you do when you get a problem? I go to the doctor, and what do you do after that? You take a drug. I don't know what else to do. See, the way we're going to fix it is we've got to get people educated on what else to do. We need to be teaching about nutrition. You're going to get Brad Watsky this weekend. And man, listen to that guy, you haven't heard him already. He's a guru for nutrition. And you've got to be balancing that nutrition. Your patients will get better. The percentage of your patients that if you don't respond to regenerative medicine, I would almost bet it's because your nutrition is off. Right? So if you look at that corner at the bottom, physical, how big is that component? What is the number one excuse me, reason to be in a hospital? Low back pain. Low back pain is number two. Number one is people want Number two, low back pain. Pretty close. Get rid of the team. What's the number two reason to be a family visit? Go back in. It's the biggest part that there is. See, the people who have chronic degenerative arthritis and know it are overshadowed by the people who have chronic degenerative arthritis and don't know. You know this. You take an x ray to somebody and go, you know, the pastor hurt me for a month. You look at the x ray and go, like, what happened to you? Nothing. Oh, you're just walking along with that turn. No, no, you did something to hurt your back. No, I didn't. You ever had that conversation? And some of you heard this conversation I had with a, a Marine or an uh, airborne from World War II. Well, you did. You hurt yourself somewhere. You broke some bones or something. Oh, yeah, I broke bones. Well, what's that got to do with it? That was a long time ago. Well, what happened? Well, a parachute from World War II. I dumped out of an airplane like she didn't know. <laughs> what happened? Well, what the heck did he have? But he was an uh, airborne, he didn't say that. And this guy was wow. What the heck did this happen? I hit the ground, I got so in the air. I spent a year in the hospital. True story. I fell out of a helicopter in Vietnam, I laid on my back. I think this was all my back. I was in a train wreck 20 years ago. And all of a sudden, I flooded here and smashed my face on the opposite side of the car. You think that's why I got in that problem now? Nothing <laughs> to do with it. This is. That is the biggest segment of health care, physical. So if you address the physical and the chemical, what do you think is going to happen to the mental component? You're going to be able to handle it better, right? You're going to be able to handle it better. They're messing with the chemicals right now. I just heard this stat last night that I'm not, I'm not going to finish it again. I'm not a, a fan of cannabis. And 
The cannabis that's in the United States is legal in a lot of states, but actually now is illegal in Amsterdam because of the THC content. And they know the effect of that long term is depression. Why do you think they're legalizing it? Because the effect of the long term is depression. And what's one of the number one selling drugs are antidepressants. So don't fall into that trap. Now, CBD oil is not cannabis. I am thinking of that. I have a dog who's a freaking nerd truck, and all of a sudden we're throwing CBD oil, and he's home. Well, close to normal, right? <laughs> close to normal, probably, right? So what's the ideal practice? The ideal practice is somebody who addresses this malady of what happens to your body when you get hurt. And what happens? We all know this. My endurance five, what's the first thing you're going to do? And how are you going to unload it? Shift forward. Shift forward. What part of my body is going to shift forward to? I can't believe like I can actually see you. The head, he's right. And that's really how you need to go back and shift the head forward off of the set. So when you do this, you do it until it's fixed. And if it takes away the pain, that's what you're going to fix. So you stay like this. And you know what this leads to? This. And this. And this. And this. And that's so common when you think it's normal. But is that normal? No. Who's in that? Glad we found it. When you shake your head forward, you start using different muscles. And this is where the trigger points come in and why we treat the trigger points. And this is why we do the rehab. Every time you shift forward, you use the wrong muscles and you get muscles to become weak. And you get muscles to become overactive. And the overactive ones cause the pain. And if you only treat those, they don't keep coming back. You gotta strengthen the weak ones. This is our rehab program called the Cross World Wrestling Road. This is how we do it. So the ideal practice would address that. And it would use not high-end equipment, but it would have people trained to handle this. We invest not in equipment, but in our staff. And then you have a team of doctors that work together. Which one is the chiropractor? You can't tell. And that's the way it's supposed to be. I'm going for the girl. Just kind of cute. No, it's too quiet. <laughs> yeah, I'm just with it. We're trying to stop the pushing of drugs. We are trying to stop the excessive surgery. And we can do it. How many of you put this model in place fully? And how many? Oh, three. Okay, well, we're going to look at it. So we're going to have a convention every month for the next five years. <laughs> So those of you who put this bottle in place, raise your hands. Does it work? Yes. Does it do those two things? Yes. Do you think we can change up here with this model? Yes. That's what we have to do. We're going to lay out for you this weekend how we can help you do that. So, to get this to change, we must be up to the challenge. We must get it known to the community. We must make alliances with each other so we're now powerful, no more divided conquer. We must know how to brand it. So you're going to have people teaching you all these things this weekend. You must be able to create better outcomes for patients in the health triangle, and we must be successful. If we're not successful, nobody's going to do this, but if we are, all the other doctors will follow of all professions. And that's starting to happen. We have started seeing medical doctors showing up at our discovery days regularly. I think the last four in a row had at least one medical doctor in attendance to put this model in their practice, and yes, we have had them do it. So, are you guys with me? Yeah! Okay, so we're going to have this awesome, awesome lineup this weekend, and we're going to have people showing you how we can take this and change it for the better. And we will all benefit and be the leaders, the early adopters in our, in our profession that will create the new model and completely disrupt the industry that is currently in place. It will be a change. There will be some pain with it. So to handle that pain, we have to be tough. And I'm going to let Ethan come up right now, and he's going to introduce <coughs> our next speaker, who's going to tell you how to be tough. <laughs> Thank you.